the classical case of a fibroadenoma can you see the multiple lobular architecture as we can appreciate over here okay much more than that can you see that they are very well circumscribed lesion okay what happened over here you tell me what has happened over here if you can appreciate the intralobular stroma has expanded and it has compressed yes can you see these are compressed ducts you cannot even see the lumen of these ducts can you see a very small amount of lumen appreciable over here so this pattern is called as the typical intracanalicular pattern this is the intracanalicular pattern microscopic examination okay this is the intra and whatever see over here in the gross also you can see the nodular architecture and the same thing if you see under microscopy you can see different different nodules yes now it is very very clear the first pattern so this is when the the gland is growing in such a way this is when the stroma is compressing the gland in this manner this is the intracanalicular pattern now there is a second pattern of growth this is also the same okay this is also the same the intracanalicular pattern this is the stromal tissue which has proliferated and which has compressed this particular duct okay now this is the other pattern wherein the uh, uh, the stroma is not directly growing Inst instead the stroma is growing in in this circular fashion this is called as a pericanalicular pattern so here also the ducts are compressed but they are compressed in a circular manner okay so this is the classical fibroadenoma with pericanalicular pattern of growth is this very crystal clear to everyone the important i will discuss the points of difference grossly they are much larger they are much larger in size as compared to a fibroadenoma okay and the gross appearance is is much a fleshy in nature okay and uh, you will see certain slit like spaces not very evident from here but leaf like leaf like or slit like spaces slit like spaces are present okay slit like spaces are present over here okay now if you see over here this is again a case of a phalloids tumor now what is this component that i am showing you this is the major tumor component yes so what is this what is this it is the intralobular stroma which has expanded yes so this is the stromal component which has expanded and if you appreciate over here this stromal component has expanded in such a way that it has rolled on itself and because it has rolled on itself it has itself created certain clefts okay can you everyone appreciate these are the cleft spaces or the leaf like spaces or leaf like configuration that is there the cleft like spaces that we can so large leaf like structures okay from the cleft which is lined by the epithelial cell so can, can everyone appreciate this becomes like a very important leaf like structure and today we are going to start with the benign breast disease okay so let us start the benign breast disease so before we start we have to understand the basic anatomy of our breast okay so if this is the breast tissue as you can appreciate this is the fat tissue that is there okay and there is a stroma there is a stromal tissue that is also there in the breast going to the stromal tissue the breast is basically made up of certain unit that is called as tdlu tdlu stands for terminal terminal duct lobular unit okay it is called as the terminal duct lobular unit that is the tdlu unit now remember this is this part as you can appreciate it is called as the duct it is the duct part okay and this part is the lobule part okay so together the duct and the lobule they form what is called as the tdlu that is terminal duct lobular unit yes everyone agrees with me in this point so the breast is made up of such tissue so this is the example of a normal lobule with a normal duct okay now one very important thing is you can appreciate that normal duct is lined by a black black myoepithelial cell lining so the normal breast epithelium is bilayered double layered so if there is a breast ductal cell okay on the outside you are also having one myoepithelial cell as well okay so the normal benign breast is having a bilayer okay it has a bilayer as you can appreciate that around the ducts okay there is a blackish lining which is continuing okay clear to everyone the normal breast is having is the normal breast is basically made up of the terminal duct lobular unit I'll, i will just repeat once more everyone okay just listen to me carefully because everyone has joined late so i will just clear it out once again
so first i am going to discuss about the normal anatomy of the breast so okay so basically the normal breast is made up of something called as the terminal duct lobular unit okay so it is comprising of this ductal component as we can appreciate over here and over here we have the lobular component as we can see okay so this together is forming what is called as the terminal duct lobular unit that is called as the tdlu okay now very importantly as you can appreciate that many small ducts uh, ductules are joining the ducts and ultimately they are opening at the level of the nipple and before they open there is a dilatation that is called as the lactiferous sinus okay the basic anatomy now the breast if you see uh, uh, it is also lined by as you can appreciate over here okay a layer of myoepithelial cells okay so normal breast if this is the normal breast ductular epithelium it is lined by a myoepithelial cell the presence of double layer the presence of this double layer indicates benign nature or indicates a normal duct okay or a normal breast tissue okay so a double lining is always indicative of a benign lesion okay always remember this so this is the terminal duct lobular unit as we can appreciate over here now apart from that you can see that there is something that is there in green in color okay so this green and this red okay both of them they constitute the stromal tissue stromal tissue so the green one is constituting the intralobular stroma intralobular stroma whereas the red one as you can see it constitutes the interlobular stroma okay why intra and inter you can understand this is the stroma which is present within the lobule so it is called as intralobular stroma which is comprising the lobule giving support to the lobule and this stroma is present in between the two lobules so we call it as interlobular stroma okay so the basic anatomy is very clear to everyone yes okay so normally as i told you there is just two cell thickening okay in the normal lining now there are various abnormalities in the breast tissue that can occur some of them are benign some of them are malignant today we are going to concentrate on the benign disorders of the breast so if you can appreciate over here sometimes there might be a hyperplasia of the ductular epithelium as you can appreciate see over here the duct epithelium is just a two layer thick okay and the entire duct is empty but over here it is completely filled up or maybe partially filled up okay so this is called as an epithelial hyperplasia which is called also called as usual ductal hyperplasia also known as udh okay now we can have benign entities like fibroadenoma this is a kind of a benign tumor which is arising from the intralobular stroma okay as we can appreciate from the intralobular stroma then there are some other disorders like hemangioma which is arising from the interlobular stroma okay so depending okay on the origin okay we can just say whether you know what is the origin of a particular tumor or any entity okay similarly over here in the malignant entities okay we have something called as ductal carcinoma in situ over here the only thing that is there that the cells they have all the features of malignancy but they have not penetrated the basement membrane so that is why they are called as ductal carcinoma in situ if they break out like this then they will cause invasive carcinoma okay and then there are certain other tumors of the uh, uh, in, uh, intralobular stroma called as the phylloids tumor now phylloids is not necessarily malignant okay no majority of the phylloids tumor if you see majority of them they are benign in nature okay so i hope you have a basic idea and sometimes okay the tumor is arising from the interlobular stroma that is angiosarcoma which is a malignant tumor so i hope you have understood the basic concept okay of the breast anatomy what are the terminal duct lobular units okay what are ducts what are lobules okay what is interlobular stroma what is intralobular stroma yes very clear to everyone okay now moving ahead this is the real histopathological image as we can appreciate okay so this is one as you can appreciate this is the lobule okay and basically this is the terminal duct so this terminal duct actually if you ask me correctly uh, this uh, the tdlu usually comprises of this terminal duct along with the lobules okay this is called as the terminal duct lobular unit so over here as we can appreciate okay over here if you can see as we can appreciate over here this is the terminal duct and this is the entire lobule as we can appreciate over here okay so lobules are usually very small in size okay so just try to imagine just try to imagine what i am showing you over here if i have taken a section if i have taken a section at this level and if i am looking from this level 
then i am going to see something like this this is what i am going to see now suppose suppose some of the section has gone through this plane then i am going to see the larger ducts okay so the ones which are having a larger uh, uh, you know diameter okay like the ones like these ones these are the bigger duct system so these are the duct system okay is it very clear to everyone so these are the ducts and these are the lobules the smaller ones they are the lobules and the lobules are comprised of multiple acinus okay is this very clear to everyone now can you tell me if i ask you if i ask you uh, what is this stroma yes what is this stroma this is intralobular stroma and in between whatever stroma is there between the lobule it is the interlobular stroma okay not very much important just basic anatomy so that it becomes easier for you to understand so today's topic of discussion is going to be discussed under three groups one is the non proliferative breast changes okay then we have the proliferative breast disease then we have the atypical hyperplasias okay so if you look over here this is this is a basically clinical classification it is a clinical classification okay it is a clinical classification which is going to classify the different kinds of diseases and also the things that we are going to discuss today so basically we have non proliferative breast diseases okay which includes like mild hyperplasia or usual ductal hyperplasia duct ectasia cyst apocrine metaplasia adenosis fibroadenoma without complex features okay so although these are all benign entities they do have a, a risk the relative risk is approximately 1 and the absolute life life lifetime risk of these lesions converting into an invasive carcinoma is around 3% similarly there are certain proliferative disease of the breast without atypia okay over here we have for example moderate or florid hyperplasia of the breast sclerosing adenosis complex sclerosing lesions fibroadenoma with complex features okay so these lesions if you see the absolute uh, risk if you see lifetime risk is around 5 to 7% and then we have proliferative disease with atypia okay where the lifetime risk is approximately 13 to 17% and this includes atypical ductal hyperplasia and atypical lobular hyperplasia so basically uh, all these things they come under the benign heading only but even though they are benign they are having some lifetime risk of conversion into a carcinoma then we have the carcinoma in situ that is the ductal carcinoma in situ and the lobular carcinoma in situ so today's topic of discussion is going to be uh, concerned with this three first three categories okay is it very clear so the first category of the disease that we are going to discuss is the non proliferative breast changes so first of all uh, basically in the previous uh, you know in the in the uh, previous years they used to use the term fibrocystic changes of the breast so actually this is a very vague term and this is a very vague term which is used by the pathologist to uh, denote a combination of breast changes like cyst formation in a breast or apocrine metaplasia apocrine basically means when a particular ductal epithelial cell becomes eosinophilic granular okay eosinophilic highly granular eosinophilic okay with abundant cytoplasm it is called as an apocrine metaplasia okay 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 now fibrocystic change usually presents as a mass of variable size that may be ill defined or well defined so what happens that in a breast okay so you might have certain enlargement or swelling might be there inside the breast now it might contain some kind of fluid but it is not very well defined like the tumor that these non proliferative changes are not well defined it might be well defined or it sometimes it might not be well defined at, at all okay so it can be a variable size okay always remember now fibrocystic change is a mixture of several benign entities taken together okay and i will tell you what are these changes so under the ultrasound imaging you will see there is a classical cyst formation cyst formation is any empty space containing fluid is a cyst formation and you might also see some amount of microcalcification which in the histopathology is like bluish in nature as a bluish change okay so two main forms if we see a cyst which is the most common type of a change that is a cystic change as we are looking at okay so these are lined by a single so there will be a cyst formation for example a duct will be enlarged this is the normal size of a duct lined by the breast epithelium okay now the the breast might be enlarged so this is called as a cystic change and they might contain some amount of fluid inside or some calcification might be there inside now this lining cell it might either be single layer of cuboidal cell or there might be a flat epithelium or sometimes they might have an apocrine epithelium as well so i will discuss in details about them 
okay so this non proliferative breast disease to the clinician it just means a lumpy bumpy breast a breast that is lumpy and bumpy so you have some kind of a swelling okay which you feel something is there some heaviness is there but there is not a very clear cut mass in the breast okay so basically because uh, but remember this is a very common finding and it is uh, having benign histological findings okay and for non proliferative breast disease as i told you the risk of conversion to carcinoma is just 3% or the relative risk is 1 okay so under the non proliferative lesions as i told you the most common as it is we use the term fibrocystic disease yes we use the term fibrocystic disease so we are having basically cyst we are having fibrosis we are having adenosis so cyst as i told you it basically means it is formed by the dilatation of lobules so whatever lobules we had seen over here if you can appreciate so this lobule that we had seen lo the lobule is going to show dilatation it will become dilated okay and it will be become dilated with some amount of fluid so this is what is known as a cyst formation which i am going to show you okay so as i told you okay as i told you if you see from the outside the cyst is going to be around uh, it is going to look like a blue colored fluid which is called as a blue domed cyst okay and the cysts are basically lined by flattened atrophic epithelium or metaplastic apocrine cells i will show you all these in the form of a diagram apocrine cells are ones which are having increased amount of granular eosinophilic cytoplasm okay often you can see calcifications as well and the and just over here i will show you this diagram so one can you appreciate can you appreciate is this the normal size of a lobule yes or is it dilated mm -hmm. dilated sir it is a dilated lobule so this is just a very basic just you have to remember this few points that cystic change one of the non proliferative change is a cystic change so over here there is a dilatation and if you appreciate over here grossly if you see what you can see there is a bluish brown discoloration bluish brown discoloration is there okay now can you tell me what are these bluish things present over here inside inside the cyst what did i tell tell you they can have calcification as well okay and this calcification on mammography if you appreciate is seen as this small dots okay so basically these are apocrine cyst these comes under the heading of fibrocystic disease or non proliferative breast disease okay so these comes under this particular heading so this is the one that is the, the one which is having the cystic change so i i hope this is very clear so the first non proliferative then sometimes what happen what you will think see what happens usually if this is a particular normal lobule now it has undergone the cystic change and now it is filled up with some amount of fluid okay now suddenly what happen this cyst is going to rupture and it is going to release the content so what is going to happen this content that is coming out it becomes like a foreign material so there will be a lot of foreign body reaction to this particular uh, material so this is going to instigate a lot of fibrosis near around so that is why long standing fibrocystic disease sometimes will become lumpy and bumpy it will become what is called as it will sometimes become very very hard okay so the cyst can frequently rupture releasing the secretory material into the adjacent stroma and that is going to cause a lot of chronic inflammation and whenever chronic inflammation is there macrophages will be there m2 macrophages are going to to try and heal and they are going to lead to fibrosis okay so this leads to nodularity in the breast okay and sometimes what happens that because of this sometimes there might be an increase in the number of acinus per lobule now for example this is the normal lobule which we have seen okay and this lobule is having for example this much is the normal amount of acini per lobule so there is 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 so there are 10 acinus per lobule over here now for example sometimes in fibrocystic disease the number of acinus per lobule it increases drastically like this okay can you appreciate this is called as adenosis this is called as adenosis very clear to everyone now normally this feature is seen in case of pregnancy okay in non pregnant uh, women also this can also occur and over here the individual acinus they are lined by the columnar epithelial cells and calcifications might also be present so calcification is not a very specific finding it is just one of the associated finding so i want to make it clear to everyone are the non proliferative changes very clear to everyone what are cyst how fibrosis will occur what is adenosis so when you are asked to write about the benign disease the, uh, under the non proliferative heading 
you should first discuss about what are the non proliferative some of the basic features what is the fibrocystic change along with that what are the main headings under it there is cyst formation fibrosis there is adenosis okay now just let me show this diagram this is another high power view of the cyst now what i really wanted to show you that sometimes the cyst can have which epithelium is this yes it can have a cuboidal epithelial lining sometimes it can be lined by a flat epithelial line, line lining as shown and sometimes can you see these cells which are having an increased amount of eosinophilic cytoplasm yes this is the apocrine epithelium that i was speaking about when they have an increased amount of cytoplasm eosinophilic color is there that is called as an apocrine epithelium is it very clear to everyone the cyst may have any kind of lining and this is the material inside the cyst any kind of material is there inside the cyst okay okay now there are few important few more points also uh, that is coming under the heading of non proliferative changes so one is lactational adenoma so what is it now when a woman is pregnant or she is lactating okay so what happens uh, that uh, sometimes they will develop increased amount of glands per lobule so there will be an adenoma there will be a mass in the breast okay and typical history of lactation is there over there okay so they can present as a palpable mass in pregnant or lactating women but usually after the women stops to uh, breastfeed that mass is going to go away it is going to disappear okay so basically what if you cut out and if you see under the microscope what you will see you will see normal appearing breast tissue but over there they have increased amount of lactational change that is also called as the secretory change that means the cells the normal breast cells are like this they will contain increased amount of cytoplasm okay and they will they will have they will have abundant uh, cytoplasm sub hobnailing will be there so this is called as a secretory changes in the breast which happens usually during pregnancy because the, of the lactation process that is going on okay is it very clear so out of all of these, these these are certain special categories okay the three most important changes are cyst fibrosis and adenosis one of the variations is lactational adenomas now usually the non proliferative changes they usually contain all the benign entities only and they are completely non neoplastic when i am saying non neoplastic it means that they are not clonal in nature except for this one entity called as a flat epithelial atypia now this is also a you know a, a fibrocystic change or a non proliferative change which is characterized by the presence of dilated acinus and cyst but there is some amount of cytological atypia that is there and which you will not be able to you know identify histologically okay but it is a clonal process that means they have some mutation okay so they are neoplastic in nature yet they are having histological features of non proliferative change but they are uh, basically clonal or neoplastic in nature it is actually one of the earliest manifestation of a clonal lesion of a breast and they are often associated with an increased risk of cancer example atypical hyperplasia okay just just remember they have an increased risk of cancer and uh, for example they have deletions of chromosome 16q so flat epithelial atypia though it histologically looks like a non proliferative change but it is a clonal process and they contain some deletions in chromosome 16 and they have a very high risk of not very high but in comparison to the other non proliferative changes they have a risk of conversion into carcinoma so these are the five headings that i would like you all to discuss under non proliferative breast disease any doubts over here yes cyst fibrosis adenosis lactational adenoma flat epithelial atypia yes everyone okay now coming to the proliferative breast disease without atypia so it is without atypia so let us try and understand so the very important thing is the disease is proliferating but atypia is not there so it is characterized by the proliferation of the epithelial cells without atypia and they are associated with a very small increase in the risk now can you tell tell me how much is the risk over here yes how much did we read over here a small increase in the risk was there so the risk is, is around 5 to 7% very good so this was the risk 5 to 7% risk is there in the proliferative disease without atypia okay in the end i am going to ask each one of you okay what are the headings under non proliferative what are the headings under proliferative disease without atypia and with atypia so i expect answers in the end okay so pay attention so here we are complete with the non proliferative breast disease now we are going to see the proliferative disease with atypia so as i told you they have a very small and this is more than the non proliferative okay so commonly they are detected as mammographic densities okay or 
calcifications or as incidental findings okay so they are considered predictors of the risk rather than the direct precursors of carcinoma so they are considered as the risk factors but not a direct cause of carcinoma so very very important point that i that i need you to understand is something which is called as usual epithelial hyperplasia also called as usual ductal hyperplasia yes everyone should understand this point very importantly now very importantly that around 25% of the breast biopsies that is done they show epithelial hyperplasia of the usual type so there is a usual type of hyperplasia okay this is what is normal and this usual type of epithelial hyperplasia is uh, basically breast cancer can develop in 4% of all the women who are developing with uh, presenting with udh okay now the group of women who have adh is very small and breast cancer develops in 10% during a 15 year follow up okay so if you follow up these patients for a quite long period of time then they will develop breast cancer so it is not very high but it is higher than that of non proliferative now very important point regarding this is this is the normal duct a normal duct or you can say a normal acinus any of them what do i want to show over here what did i tell you about the breast how much cell layer is the breast uh, thick yes it is two, two cell layer thick so can you see layer. this is the ductal cells can you appreciate this is a ductal cells okay always remember these are the ductal cells which is there and if you can appreciate the outer layer that is the myoepithelial layer it is the myoepithelial layer okay now the presence of the myoepithelial layer indicates that a particular condition is benign it is helpful for diagnosis and what is the normal thickness normal thickness is usually it is two cell thick yes now what is the definition when will i say that a particular uh, slide that we are looking at there is an epithelial hyperplasia so normally it should be two cell thick but for example for example so whenever there is an increase in the number of the cell layers more than the normal two layers okay more than the normal two layers of the normal epithelial cell and the myoepithelial cell layer it is called as epithelial hyperplasia and what is the definition by definition it should be four cells or more in thickness to be qualified as a epithelial hyperplasia or a usual epithelial hyperplasia is it very clear to everyone yes usual epithelial hyperplasia now you have to understand one very important thing this epithelial hyperplasia can either be mild it can be moderate or it can be florid in nature so when i am saying a mild usual epithelial hyperplasia that means when the cell thickness is not more than 4 cells so it is between 2 to 4 cell thickness moderate means more than equal to 4 cell thickness okay but over here some bridging of the luminal space may occur but over here florid means it is very high okay such that no luminal space is seen all space is completely obliterated over here you will not understand any anything if i don't show you a diagram so can you appreciate see this is normal two cell thick look at this is it not very clearly more than two cell layer thick yes everyone tell me yes now i will ask you what are these yes, cells sir. what are these cells these are the luminal epithelial cells or the ductal epithelial cells these are the ductal and as i showed you what are these what is this layer of cell this is the myoepithelial layer of cell okay now very very clearly try to understand what i am saying i understand one very important thing over here the cells are basically 2 to 3 approximately 3 layer uh, uh, thick is this also 3 so it is not reaching 4 or more over here so we call it as the mild type of epithelial hyperplasia mild epithelial hyperplasia okay try to understand very carefully now over here very importantly what we can see that in between there is a bridging okay and there are some spaces irregular spaces that is still appreciable or very well appreciable over here okay and the myoepithelial layer is preserved over here there are two to three cell thickness over here the epithelial cell bridges are basically formed over here that we can appreciate over here and the lumen is irregular in shape now this point that i am telling you okay this point okay this point i am marking with star presence of myoepithelial layers okay presence of irregular shape irregular shape okay irregular shape also they have a combination of different kinds of cells they have presence of lymphocytes also so a half a z half a z arrangement of cell is there yes you will appreciate it is a half a z arrangement of cell along with different population of cell along with different population of cell 
these three points i want you that you keep in your mind thoroughly why am i telling you that you should keep this point thoroughly in your mind the reason the reason is because these three point is going to differentiate your typical epithelial hyperplasia from atypical hyperplasia as well as from dcis okay ductal carcinoma and so keep this point very clearly what points am i talking about the presence of myoepithelial cell layer the presence of irregular shapes the presence of this empty irregular shapes okay the presence of this half hazard arrangement if you can see the cells are present in a half hazard manner plus there are different population of cells that you can appreciate over here all these things are not only the features of epithelial hyperplasia but it is going to help us and differentiate the usual type of epithelial hyperplasia from atypical hyperplasia you will understand more later on okay so let me just come so this is your mild variety of hyperplasia look over here look over here and tell me can you see any kind of a space no but over here what are the things which is very important there are different populations of cell which is present half a dozen population of cells are present over here now what is the thickness it is very very high very very high thickness is there it is more than actually how much 10 layer thick yes so it is a florid hyperplasia but it is still normal why am i saying it is normal yes what are these cells which is already there present my epithelial cells they are already present over here very good now yet yet even if it is a florid hyperplasia some amount of irregular spaces are still maintained at the periphery if you will appreciate yes agreed or no it is present okay and again the arrangement of the cell again is half hazard it is half hazard okay very clear to everyone so these three points are very important so it is a usual type of hyperplasia but it is a florid variety now why it is important to differentiate into mild moderate and florid because if you have seen in this particular classification that i have shown you it is taken from robbins only okay so it is not from a very high five book it is from the usual robbins only okay so if you appreciate over here the risk changes from mild moderate and high and this so if you see the mild type of epithelial hyperplasia it is coming under the non proliferative heading so the risk is very less in case of mild whereas if you see the moderate or the florid type of hyperplasia the risk increases and it comes under the heading of proliferative disease without atp now you understand why i, I was telling you uh, difference between mild moderate and florid hyperplasia yes is it to everyone okay now let's go ahead mm, proliferative disease okay now let let us look at this particular diagram the usual epithelial hyperplasia as we have already seen okay the cardinal features of usual epithelial hyperplasia so i don't think that anything else is required over here it is the same thing that whatever things half hazard arrangement of cells is there okay presence of myoepithelial cells is there irregular irregular shapes are there okay so this is uh, having all the features that we are seeing and uh, different cell populations are there okay so what is very important over here to understand that what are the features which is very important that is there will be a normal bilayer of cells with the presence of myoepithelial cells okay and there are cells which are more than two cell layer so if it is two to four cell layer thick it is mild more than four is moderate and if it is very high it becomes florid now as i told you the population of cell will be mixed okay so you will be having epithelial cells with they predominate they are more but myoepithelial cells and lymphocytes may also be present now they have a half hazard distribution of cells which i have already laid out for you and the luminal spaces as i showed you they are irregular they are not sharply defined they are often a slit like as i showed you they are like this or they are like this like this okay clear to everyone yes okay so there is no doubt with regard to usual now when i will i'm going to discuss atypical hyperplasia then i am going to discuss that point with you all now coming to the next uh, proliferative disease without atpia is a sclerosing adenosis now what happens over here there is an increased proliferation of acinus and intralobular stromal cells so it is not only so uh, you will not be able to understand just like this so i just have to give you one example again so if you remember this particular um this particular slide okay so this is the individual acinus that we are looking at okay and this is the intralobular stroma that we are looking at so both of them increase and they are increasing in a disorderly fashion such that this entire thing is going to become very huge okay so do you understand so disorderly proliferation of both the acinus and the intralobular stroma will be seen in sclerosing adenosis okay
so it gives an overall appearance of a world appearance is there now as a result of this proliferation the asanal luminous may become completely obliterated so normally everything is like this now if for example the in between stromal tissue is going to proliferate so what is going to happen okay this asanas is going to become flat because of the excessive growth of this uh, stromal tissue okay so sometimes the asanas uh, will become obliterated but very important as i told you the two layered epithelium will be there so one ductal epithelium and myoepithelial uh, lining is always maintained over here okay the nucleus will be small regular without atpia sometimes microcalcification might be present and it is a very non specific finding Calci microcalcification can be present in ductal carcinoma in uh, as well as in non it's a very non specific finding okay now very importantly over here the sometimes the sclerosing adenosis might develop a stromal fibrosis there might be an excessive amount of fibrosis such that the lumen of the asinus might be completely compressed okay and it might look like an invasive carcinoma so that is why this uh, sclerosing adenosis is important okay and the risk of subsequent carcinoma it is just like the proliferative disease without atpia so it is 5 to 7% only so look over here at is so will you agree with me in this point or no yes see the lobules so all the asinus over here as you can see they have proliferated yes some of and can you see the shape they have been compressed also yes they have been compressed as well and also some of them are showing fibrocystic change as well on one side so this is what is called as a sclerosing adenosis because not only the number of glands are increased but also the in between stroma has increased so is it very clear to everyone so in the normal case they were orderly arranged okay but in in this sclerosing adenoma their number have increased as well as they have become disordered in their arrangement so disorderly arrangement of the asinus along with increased synthesis of these the, the intralobular stroma sometime leading to the compression of this particular asinus very clear to everyone sclerosing adenosis okay th this is the high power view why did i want to show you the high power view yes what is the reason because if you see over here can you appreciate what are what is this cell yes what is this cell that is that i am showing you over here these are the presence of myoepithelial cells so what do i want to say that these are all benign entities okay that is why i am so uh, there is maintenance of the myoepithelial cell layer okay now okay show yes. the myoepithelial cell layer yes. by zooming okay i'll just show zooming i don't think is that much possible over here i will try uh, but i will show you over here the myoepithelial cell see they are there okay they are there myoepithelial cells it see over here can you appreciate this cell over here it's a myoepithelial cell okay it is it is a myoepithelial cell again i will show you uh, see these cells over here which are spindle shaped flat these are the myoepithelial cells which are present these are flat cells present just around they might not be present completely see over here these cells okay so the cells which are present just around the ducts okay it is there trust me it is there okay okay sir. it is there now uh, just to confirm sometime people have confusion for this so you can carry out an immunohistochemistry so as to outline the myoepithelial component and in this immunohistochemical staining this has come out to be positive it has just stained the myoepithelial component these are the ductal cells over here which has not been stained on the outside the myoepithelial component has been stained thus proving the benign nature of this particular disorder now uh, the next uh, pro uh, proliferative disease without atpia is the radial scar or complex sclerosing lesion now over here basically what is happening i will not go into the details else you will become confused so there is a central area okay there is a central area of fibrosis central area of fibrosis okay and especially they have elastic fibrosis they have elastic tissue fibrosis okay and because of this central fibrosis there are certain amount of ductules okay the certain amounts of ducts which get or small tubules are there which get trapped okay certain amount of tubules as you can see and they get compressed as you can appreciate over here and from this fibrosis from the central area of fibrosis they radiates okay they will radiate uh, this area of fibrosis like a star okay that is why it is called as a radial scar it is radiating 
okay and in the areas that they are radiating okay this area of radiating tissue is also containing certain ducts with cystic change or fibrocystic change yes appreciated everyone okay they are containing this thing also so grossly if you see uh, ma mammographically if you appreciate they are appearing as a mammographic radio dense projection as you can appreciate and grossly the area will become very very fibrotic in nature okay it has irregular border so what happens that you might think that grossly it looks like a cancer because a, a cancerous tissue is having an irregular firm border but what is it that you how you can differentiate this it's a very very simple point of differentiation not given in any, any books uh, any kind of a radial sclerosis that if you see if you look from your naked eyes it will be shiny and glossy in color but if you look at a tumor it will be dull in color and that will come with practice okay not very necessary but if you are asked a practical point you can give this point okay so grossly it might mimic it is not as firm as invasive carcinoma okay and it is glossy or shiny in nature now as i told you this radial scar is composed of a central nidus of small tubules entrapped in a densely fibrotic stroma comprised of elastic tissue and there are numerous projections from this central tissue containing epithelium of various degrees some of them showing hyperplasia and some of showing fo uh, cyst formation now see over here in this diagram this is the area of nidus showing fibrocystic change agreed this is the area which is showing epithelial hyperplasia why am i saying hyperplasia see over here this is the normal two layer thickening but see over here does it look like a two layer thickening yes it doesn't look like a two layer thickening it is having more than two cell layer thick okay so very clear to everyone so these changes might be there so this is called as a radial scar so the as i told you the radial scar composed of central star shaped or stellate nodules with a dense center as we see okay with a very dense center so the central nidus is basically having entrapped glands in a hyalinized stroma surrounded by radiating projections into the stroma okay now this dense sclerotic lesion is composed of elastic tissue as i told you okay and the central tubules they become compressed because of the growth of the stromal tissue but what is again which is differentiating these lesions from any carcinoma the normal two layer of the myoepithelium and the ductal epithelium is maintained okay now very importantly in the tubular structures are also present in the radiating arms and some of them might show cystic change and some of them might show epith uh, epithelial hyperplasia as well so very importantly one of the differential diagnosis that you should understand is nodular form of sclerosing uh, adenosis and from tubular carcinoma so you have to differentiate from them how you will differentiate from tubular carcinoma because in tubular carcinoma the myoepithelial layer will not be preserved okay whereas in case of radial scar the myoepithelial layer will be preserved so you can carry out the immunohistochemistry if you cannot appreciate the myoepithelial cell markers okay always remember this term is a misnomer radial scar scar means that maybe there was a previous surgery but it is not associated with any previous uh, trauma or any previous surgery okay is this clear to everyone any doubts till here anyone is having no sir okay now coming over here this is very very easy again a separate a, a, a separate thing just the key words you should remember a central nidus is there over here entrapped glands are there okay then there are radiating arms some of them are showing epithelial proliferation some of them are showing cystic change i think this is very very easy not very difficult okay okay now comes something called as a duct papilloma this is also coming under the same heading we are taking it under the same heading of proliferative disease without atp okay so over here there are basically two types of papilloma depending on the area of involvement if it is involving the main duct it is called as a central duct papilloma okay and the central one is arising from the main duct and they are usually single whereas the peripheral one is arising from the tdlus as i showed you and they are often multiple now very important thing i will just show you over here this is what a duct papilloma looks like now remember papilla the term is papilla any kind of papilla that you hear or papilloma or papilla any kind a papillary carcinoma anything that means they have presence of what is called as a fibro vascular core okay a fibro vascular core so they are having some fibrous tissue and inside they are having vascular core and they are present in the form of a papillae 
so can you appreciate this papillary structure this is the classical papillary structure and over here if you see there is the blood vessels which are also present over here also here it is present i will show you i have shown you this diagram so as to elucidate the origin of the tumor so this is actually one duct if you see and from this duct if you see okay this has given rise to this structure that is the papilloma okay can you appreciate everyone this is a uh, origin from a single duct okay so this is a duct from where you where this papilloma has arisen okay so a large duct papilloma distends and fill a particular duct space this is the duct space okay which has been covered by the papilloma now this is what i mean fibrovascular core when i am saying any kind of papilla has a fibrovascular core that means they have a fibrous tissue as is appreciated over here along with that they have a vascular tissue as well yes appreciated by everyone so this together forms the fibrovascular core and what is this structure called as yes this is the papillary structure papilla the papillary structure though i cannot demonstrate the presence of the myoepithelial cells over here but myoepithelial cells are present okay so the demonstration of the bilayer of the myoepithelium and the epithelium is indicating the benign nature of duct papilloma okay so now i am reading the terms so solitary central benign duct papilloma do not have any increased risk of subsequent carcinomas but multiple papillomas they have an association with concurrent dcis or an increased risk of subsequent carcinoma okay so usually you are going to see a fibro fatty specimen just like this okay a surgeon is going to send just like you have some kebab is something like that you will see a fibro fatty tissue in which no gross abnormality you can appreciate microscopically you uh, the papillomas are composed of fibrovascular core and they are attached by a stalk to the duct wall so as i showed you over here yes you can appreciate yes this is the papilloma which is this is the stalk by which it is attached to this particular duct very clear this is a transverse section and from top we are viewing this okay clear to everyone okay so they may be accompanied by any kind of epithelial lesion not very important point what is very important that most of these large duct papillomas are situated in the lactiferous sinus of the nipple and they are usually solitary in nature so i hope you remember where is the lactiferous sinus and very important that more than 80% of the large duct papillomas they present with nipple discharge which is bloody in nature so this history is very important when you get some question in the exam if there is a a bloody discharge okay and if it is not a very you know um, apparent mass if you can appreciate then always go for duct papilloma as the answer okay very very important okay then then we come to the proliferative breast changes with atypia that is the third heading for today's lecture that is the atypical ductal hyperplasia okay so if you have understood the usual ductal hyperplasia okay then you will understand adh as well as dcis very nicely so you look at this particular duct system okay you look at this particular duct system okay now first of all one thing is there what are these cells yes what are these cells myoepithelial cells yes the myoepithelial cells are present so that is the reason we are yet considering them under the benign entities first you should agree with this but are all the entities that we had discussed in usual ductal hyperplasia matching with this yes is it matching now you people tell me what are the differences that we can appreciate from that previous diagram i will just show you the diagram again look at this diagram carefully and now uh, and look at this previous diagram that we had seen wait yes look at this particular diagram look at the cells look at the arrangement try to remember the points that i discussed and you tell me what differences do you appreciate in between the usual hyperplasia from this uh, atypical hyperplasia so this was the original image that we had seen okay and this is the atypical hyperplasia that i am showing you now you tell me what are the differences that you appreciate yes tell me cells are more regular here compared to that very good so very very important thing over here is if you see these luminal spaces they are quite regular luminal spaces regular lumen spaces 
and they are we call it as punched out we call it as punched out luminal space okay and if you see the cell it doesn't look like that there is a different population of cell it looks like a more monomorphic appearance a more monomorphic or homogeneous appearance of cell and the cells are arranged in a very tidy manner they are not in a, there is no haphazard arrangement there is no haphazard haphazard arrangement is not there no haphazard arrangement that was seen over there is this very clear to everyone a uniform population of cell punched out regular luminal space okay and a very uh, you know orderly arrangement of the cell so these are very very important points of difference from atypical ductal uh, from usual ductal hyperplasia is this very clear to everyone is it not very simple enough now to differentiate the two entities yes so i will just now if you have understood this much then you will understand then you have then you will 100% understand dcis as well from this diagram only so if you see adh is the lesions which are having some but not all features of dcis are called as adh so what is the meaning of that the meaning is that at least that in case of ductal carcinoma in situ also you have all these features all the features that is present over here will be present in dcis as well but the dcis they have more extent of the disease so according to the definition uh, what are the criteria c a uniform population of cells with geometric spaces between the of uh, the cells hyperchromatic nucleus these three are present in both adh as well as ductal carcinoma in situ these three are not present in usual ductal hyperplasia okay so very important point is that then how do we differentiate between adh and dcis so page so th there was some histopathologist who said that these changes they should be present in at least two duct spaces for the diagnosis of dcis any lesion which is falling short of this is called as atypical ductal hyperplasia so these changes should be present in at least two duct spaces or they should be present in an area of at least 2 mm in maximum dimension to qualify it as a dcis anything falling short of this will be the definition of adh and the who criteria for 2019 who has also stated that they should be covering at least 2 mm area so all these changes that i showed you so these changes if they are involving two duct spaces or an area of minimum 2 mm square then we will say dcis if not we are going to call it as atypical ductal hyperplasia these are very few few points that you have to remember by which you will differentiate and these are the only points you have to write in the exam so the examiner knows that you know the difference between everything is it very clear to everyone any doubts with regard to udh adh and dcis yes everyone any doubt no sir should be very crystal clear there is just simple mathematics over here okay now very few exam entities that is there very important question that is exam question that is your fibroadenoma how is it important exam question plus in your practical in your gross they will keep the fibroadenoma very important specimen so it is a very why it is important it is the most common benign tumor of the female breast and two third of the fibroadenoma they are having a driver mutation in met 12 now you see this mutation it is a very recent mutation not given in any bigger books just i found this in robins and then i cross check with the latest edition of who they also had this so this met 12 mutation is very new and it is given so you, so you can expect mcqs from this part okay so fibroadenomas can have from very small to very large size okay and they are usually presenting as a palpable mass in young women okay so clinically you will see a very young woman in 20s or 30s presenting with with multiple bilateral fibroid okay and uh, because they are hormone responsive so they can grow to large size during pregnancy and they usually regress in size after menopause so in pregnancy they can have a very rapid growth in pregnancy because the amount of estrogen increases so because of that but after pregnancy this is going to subside okay also there is a particular drug called as cyclosporin a which is given to individuals with uh, who was who are undergoing renal transplantation so such individuals with uh, uh, who are having this drug cyclosporin a can develop multiple bilateral fibroadenomas okay but they regress after stoppage of the drug and remember as i told you over here 
that fibroadenomas they are divided into two parts like the one with usual features the one with complex features okay so i'm just going to show you take you back to this particular uh, this thing okay so if you see again over here again over here i have kept the fibroadenoma with complex features fibroadenomas with complex features is kept under proliferative disease without atp okay what fibroadenomas okay with uh, 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 with without complex features are come they come under non proliferative breast tissue so the risk is very much less so you have to differentiate and you have to understand what are the complex features implicating fibroadenoma because the risk factor changes in that situation okay so let us go back so basically fibroadenomas without complex features they have a very less risk of carcinoma 3% only but if they are having complex features what are complex features so for example if a fibroadenoma is having a cyst cystic change larger than 0.3 cm or a fibroadenoma is also having associated sclerosing adenosis or there is any epithelial calcification or any papillary apocrine change so all these are fibroadenomas with complex features in that case they will come under non proliferative breast disease Uh, without atp and the risk of carcinoma will shoot up to 5 to 7% okay always remember this point now looking at this diagram now very important this is the gross appearance of a yes tell me i can't hear you okay is the voice audible now is it all right now so can you please repeat okay i am just saying that fibroadenoma can be of two main uh, means fibroadenoma can in turn be divided into the ones which are having complex features and the ones which are having you the you the usual variety that is without complex features so fibroadenomas which are having the complex features like uh, your uh, cyst changes or sclerosing adenosis or epithelial calcifications or apocrine change they will come under non proliferative breast disease without uh, atp whereas the usual one will come under non proliferative one so the risk of uh, subsequent carcinoma in the usual variety is very less is 3% whereas in the complex variety the risk goes up to 5 to 7% this is the only thing i i told is it clear now yes sir okay, yes sir chal. now i am not going to details of this i am just going to explain over here now this is a classical case of a fibroadenoma can you see the multiple lobular architecture as we can appreciate over here okay much more than that can you see that they are very well circumscribed lesion okay they have a classical capsule so grossly these are very sharply circumscribed lesions grayish white nodules that bulge above the surrounding tissue okay and it is usually slightly lobulated the cut surface is usually slightly lobulated as i showed you and have a glistening myxoid appearance so as you can appreciate yes they are having a slightly glistening appearance as we can appreciate over here they are sharply demarcated yes they are sharply demarcated lesions yes they are bulging and they are very well circumscribed lesions okay clear to everyone how they appear grossly okay microscopically remember there are two patterns okay now you will not be able to understand this if i don't take you back to the first point why am i saying you this now first try to understand what is it okay what is it and from where is the tumor arising so fibroadenoma is a tumor which is arising from this stroma and what is this stroma called as yes tell me what is this stroma called as intralobular intralobular stroma now what is going to happen you tell me what is going to happen if this intralobular stroma is growing what will it do to the ducts if for example this is the normal duct okay and basically this is the normal intralobular stroma now if the amount of intralobular stroma increases very high is there any space for the ducts the duct is going to become like this it is going to become compressed in this particular manner now let me show you so this is the first important pattern of fibroadenoma it's an exam slide okay in your exams you will have this slide what has happened over here you tell me what has happened over here if you can appreciate the intralobular stroma has expanded and it has compressed yes can you see these are compressed ducts you cannot even see the lumen of these ducts can you see a very small amount of lumen appreciable over here so this pattern is called as the typical intracanalicular pattern this is the intracanalicular pattern microscopic examination 
Okay, this is the intra and whatever. See over here in the gross also, you can see the nodular architecture. And the same thing, if you see under microscopy, you can see different different nodules. Yes. Now it is very very clear the first pattern. So this is when the the gland is growing in such a way. This is when the stroma is compressing the gland in this manner. This is the intra canalicular pattern. Now there is a second pattern of growth. This is also the same. Okay, this is also the same. The intra canalicular pattern. This is the stromal tissue which has proliferated and which has compressed this particular duct. Okay, now this is the other pattern wherein the uh, uh, the stroma is not directly growing. Insta instead, the stroma is growing in in this circular fashion. This is called as a peri canalicular pattern. So here also the ducts are compressed, but they are compressed in a circular manner. Okay, so this is the classical fibroadenoma with peri canalicular pattern of growth. Is this very crystal clear to everyone? Fibroadenoma with peri canalicular pattern. And fibroadenoma with intracanalicular pattern, very clear to everyone. So basically, the dominant element in the fibroadenoma is the proliferation of the loose intralobular stromal connective tissue, and the stromal cells are spindle-shaped and they might exhibit little pleomorphism. Okay, remember this very important point. Now the ductules can vary in different uh, configuration depending on the growth of the stromal tissue. So one of them is the intracanalicular pattern that I showed you, where they are compressed by the stroma into the clefts, and one is your pericanalicular pattern. In the pericanalicular pattern, the stroma appears to surround the ductules in a circumferential fashion, as we have discussed. Sometimes both the patterns can be seen in the same lesion. Okay. Now the three important differential diagnoses. Of uh, of this is one is your Fallard's tumor, another one is your hematoma, third one is your fibromatosis. Now Fallard's is the most important differential diagnosis, so we are going to last discuss about the Fallard's tumor and then we are going to rest for the day. Now Fallard's is also very much like the fibroadenoma, why? Because they are also arising from the, excuse me, from the intralobular stroma. Okay, but it is far. The incidence of Fallard's tumor in comparison to fibroadenoma is very less. The other important thing is that Fallard's tumor is presenting at a very late stage, approximately 20-30 years later than the peak age of fibroadenoma. And very importantly, unlike fibroadenoma, which is completely regarded as a uh, benign entity, you know, most around 70-80 percent of all the Fallard's tumor they are low grade and benign in nature. Okay, but there are certain borderline and high-grade Fallard's tumor. Okay, also that can metastasize and that can and that is malignant in nature, but that is very less. So that is the difference between Fallard's and fibroadenoma. Okay, Achha, one very important thing is uh, over here is uh, that uh, just like the fibroadenoma, they are also having the MET12 mutations. Okay, now. In now earlier, they used to use the term cystosarcoma phylloids for the Fallard's tumor. Before they used to use this term, but the term sarcoma, when it is coming, you know, it it gives you a sense of you know of cancer. So that is not good because 80, 90 percent of the Fallard's is benign nature. So why to call it as cystosarcoma phylloids? So that is why this is an old term and it is not to be used now. Okay, now we just have benign Fallard's or malignant Fallard's tumor. Okay, okay. Now, very important. I will discuss the points of difference. Grossly, they are much larger. They are much larger in size as compared to a fibroadenoma. Okay, and the gross appearance is is much fleshy in nature. Okay, and uh, you will see certain slit-like spaces, not very evident from here, but leaf-like leaf. -like leaf Like or slit-like spaces, slit-like spaces are present. Okay, slit-like spaces are present over here. Okay, now if you see over here, this is again a case of a Fallard's tumor. Now, what is this component that I am showing you? This is the major tumor component. Yes. So, what is this? What is this? It is the intralobular stroma which has expanded. Yes, so this is the stromal component which has expanded, and if you appreciate over here, this stromal component has expanded in such a way that it has rolled on itself, and because it has rolled on itself, it has itself created certain clefts. 
okay can you everyone appreciate these are the cleft spaces or the leaf like spaces or leaf like configuration that is there the cleft like spaces that we can so large leaf like structures okay from the cleft which is lined by the epithelial cells so can, can everyone appreciate this becomes like a very important leaf like structures okay and there are clefts over here which is nothing but because of the stromal tissue which has increased in size okay so the associated cellular stroma is also appreciable over here okay now this is another case over here phalaj tumor now basically fibroadenoma it doesn't have any kind of pleomorphism but in case of phalaj tumor little bit nuclear pleomorphism as we can appreciate over here can be seen but it is not to worry okay little bit pleomorphism uh, in comparison to fibroadenoma is there so nothing to worry in that sense but this is a case of a malignant uh, phalloids if you can appreciate malignant phalloids where you can see definitive see this is an abnormal mitotic figure hyperchromatia is there abnormal arrangement of cell is there so this is definitely a case of a malignant phalloids tumor okay now you tell me is this point very clear with regards to phalloids i'm just going to repeat the points so just like the fibroadenoma the phalloids is also a lobulated mass but it is larger in size okay average size is 5 well circumscribed with bosselated contours okay now the cut surface shows a characteristic world pattern resembling a leaf bud with visible clefts as i showed you that over here because the stroma is growing on itself so it might show it might show what is called as clefts okay it is not very much visible over here but grossly if you see you can see certain clefting it there is a clefting because the stroma is growing on itself so there is a lot of clefting there is a lot of bosselated appearance over here as you can appreciate fleshy leaf like bosselated slit like appearance is there okay large tumors might also show focus of hemorrhage and necrosis now microscopically as i told you we have to appreciate two things one is you have clefts okay clefts means empty spaces clefts meaning of cleft is empty spaces so microscopy what are we appreciating over here yes now you people answer to me what are this what is this these are the clefts or the empty spaces so microscopically the presence of cleft is very very important okay so microscopically clefts are present over here okay one other thing is associated a cellular stroma associated cellular stroma so can you appreciate yes this is the associated cellular stroma which has proliferated and this is the lining epithelium and if you watch closely they have a myoepithelial layer indicating they are benign phalloids okay they are benign phalloids in nature okay now in majority of the cases as i told you they are benign in nature and the stroma just in comparison to fibroadenoma the stroma is far more cellular and they show little bit pleomorphism um, as compared to fibroadenoma it is little bit more but a minority of the fiber uh, phalloids will show frankly sarcomatous change with increased nuclear atp and increased mitotic count okay so when this is present they are clear indicators of malignancy okay now the differential diagnosis as i told you is the fibroadenoma and how to differentiate you already know okay i have discussed the points regarding the same so any doubts anyone is having with regards to phalloids tumor or fibroadenoma or the microscopy of the same yes anyone sir yes tell me so what what are the different uh, differential diagnosis of um, fibroadenoma see the differential diagnosis of fibroadenoma is for example the tumors which are arising from the intralobular stroma that is that we have discussed one is the phalloid the first difference will be phalloid so i have already discussed the difference between the phalloids and the fibroadenoma the second point of difference is the hamartoma now hamartoma if you see is also arising from there but then it has some different histological features as compared to a fibroadenoma but because it is also arising from the intralobular stroma so because of that so hamartoma is nothing but your usual tissue is present in a disorganized manner that is what a hamartomatous lesion is it can occur anywhere in the body including the breast okay this is the second important differential diagnosis the third is fibromatosis in case of fibromatosis you will have proliferation of the fibrous tissue that will come out to be positive for cd34 immunohistochemical marker okay so this is how you can differentiate 